So, it's not every message you get to start with a real sword. This is a sharp sword. And, and I was thinking of that verse in Proverbs 27 where it says, as iron sharpens iron, or in this case, as a stone sharpens iron. And you know, it's, I did this last night too, and I only lost one digit. <laughs> but this picture that says every one of us need to be developing a better spiritual edge, and I can take this rock and I could ruin this edge. So it's not only being involved in sharpening, it's doing it skillfully and carefully and intentionally. And so we are talking in Luke chapter 10, if you have your Bibles turned there, we're talking about how is it that Jesus discipled his disciples. What are some of the how-tos and how does that apply to what we then do? Not only how do we become sharper as disciples, but how do we become skilled at helping sharpen others? That's where I feel like most of our, our focus needs to be because I feel like that is what we are often weak at. So I have a good buddy, his name is Joe Leininger, and uh, he was a commodities trader in Chicago, and then he had a cowboy phase by which he came to Douglas County, and then after six, seven years, he's now back in Colorado, and uh, he decided there was no margin in cattle, just for the rest of you to know that. But he was a great friend of mine, is a great friend of mine, and we would go to coffee and we would talk, and he was involved as a very encouraging part of my life. God's brought friends like that in all through my life. And so he would reflect on the message, ask questions. We had some great conversations. And one day he said to me, you know, what's going on here at Sutherland is, is wonderful. You've, you've got a little church and a tiny little community, and, and you're, you're making a difference. But here's a question I have for you. What are you doing here that impacts the world? And I'm a pastor, so I gave an answer. I whipped out some things about what we were doing in our missions program and some other things. But you know what? I walked away thinking, that was not a good answer. And that question bothered me for about a year and a half. You ever had somebody ask you a question and it just kind of worms in and keeps bugging you? I want to teach you how to make those kind of questions a part of your life. Because when he asked me that, I started thinking, what are the things that we can do? We don't have a lot of money or a lot of reach or a lot of worldwide importance. And God began revealing and opening up things that we could become not only more mission-driven, but how we can do things like Operation Christmas Child, how we can do things that in our own town we're making a difference around the world. It's a change of mindset. And a great question opens your brain up to learning something new and important. And I think as teachers, we are far more adept at giving people answers than we are at making them think. I tell young people, don't let your education get in the road of your curiosity. Because unfortunately, you know what one of the most commonly asked questions in a classroom is? Is it going to be on the test? <laughs> what does that say? That says I'm not really interested in growing or learning or becoming expanded in this area. I just want to know what's the minimum I can get by with so I can answer your stupid questions on the test so I can immediately forget it. And I'm afraid that thinking bleeds over into our churches and into our spiritual life. And so I want to introduce this whole topic under the way that Jesus did discipling is that knowing must become doing. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, and Jesus is in the process of training his disciples. Did you ever think what would have happened if Jesus had been just a great teacher and a miracle worker and he'd walked around and when he died and when he went back to heaven, he had nobody trained to follow him? And you realize he took a band of fishermen and tax collectors and arguers. And in three years, he turned them into a force that changed the world. I think we ought to look at how he did it. Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager, was an unbeliever for much of his life. And then finally he came to Christ and he started reading the New Testament. And he went to some of his pastor friends and he says, you guys have been holding out on me. 
And he's like, what are you talking about? He said, you told me that Jesus was the savior of the world. You didn't tell me he was the best leader ever. And Ken Blanchard wrote another book, and you know what it's called? Lead Like Jesus. And he takes the principles from the scripture, and I think it's too easy for us to read the New Testament and to think we're picking up facts, we're picking up information, but we're not observing what Jesus did and what he then tells us to do. So, obviously, Jesus taught. In the chapter 9, you see the, the various kinds of things that Jesus taught his disciples. He cast out demons, he feeds the 5,000, he, in fact, takes three of them up on a hill, and it says he's transfigured, which means his humanity fell away, and they saw the real Jesus shining through, and it kind of blew their minds. But he was telling them, who am I, and what am I here about, and what's the kingdom of God like, and what is God like? So he was teaching them all the time, and, and last week, Pastor Will talked to us about that the Bible is such a critically important part of discipleship, that me learning from the Bible... And I don't mean what's a new factoid I can go home with. What I mean is that it's spiritual food. And have you noticed that the last book you read, the last movie you watched, the last person you talked to, how it influences your thinking for a long time? Whether it makes you mad at them or whether it makes you influenced by them, it occupies your thinking. So we need a regular diet of Jesus' teaching, even if you think you already know it. Because it stirs us up, it challenges us, it, it puts it back in the forefront of our thinking. So Jesus taught all the time, but then he takes the next step, and in chapter 2 or 10, verse 1, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You see, Jesus had a, here's what you need to know time, and then he said, now here's what you need to do. And we are much better at the here's what you need to know than we are at the here's what you need to do. And we need to move from one to the next. And so Jesus, in the beginning of chapter 9, he sent out the 12. And they went out and they experienced a telling people that the kingdom of God is coming. They experienced people listening. They experienced people rejecting them. And now there's a larger group of disciples. He appoints 72. And he says, I want you to go out. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? I mean, you're walking around with Jesus. And he is commanding those storms to stop. He's casting out demons. He feeds 5,000 people at a whack. And now he says, okay, you go do what I do. Can you imagine how inadequate you'd feel? Like, wow, Jesus is up here and I'm way down here. And, and I'm supposed to be the warm-up act. Did you see this? He sends them to every place where he was about to go. Oh, great. I'm going to go so you can come along to show me up. Can you imagine how tempting it would have been to say, no, I'm out. This is too scary. I don't know enough. I've only been in this thing for a year. I imagine the, the excuses that came to their mind were plentiful, but you know what? They went. And here's the point is I believe that Jesus is still giving assignments. I believe that part of your spiritual development is learning to serve, learning to do, learning to put into process, into your life, what you're learning mentally that the learning part is only the first beginning phase, then he says, here's your assignment. And of course, Jesus was giving them literal assignments, and he tells them, go to the villages, find a home where the man of peace lives. I want you to tell them the kingdom of God is coming. If they reject you, knock the dust off your shoes when you go out of town. If they accept you, stay there. And he gave them very specific instructions. And, and I thought, he also told them, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Boy, that'd build your confidence, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, good. I thought this was going to be easy. And you know what? They did it. They came back and they said, okay, we gave you that assignment. And by the Holy Spirit now, listen carefully, 
Jesus is giving you assignments. He's giving me assignments. I think he does it every day. The only question is, am I listening? And even more importantly, am I saying yes? Am I obeying? Am I following through? Because it's easy for us to become just like students at school that say, what's going to be on the test? What do I need to do to fill in my outline? What do I need to do to just say that I sound like a really intelligent Christian? And then Jesus says, I want you to do. I want you to step out of knowing. And you know what's interesting? Is that doing makes you want to know more. When you have all the answers and none of the questions, you sound very bright, but you are so bored with it. When you have lots of questions and no answers, you feel confused. When questions and answers are coming in succession, which is why God makes me teach, because I have to keep learning and growing, because when you're teaching, you're always learning. So God gives us assignments, and the key question is, how does that work? And you see what he did is a very simple process of great leadership. He said, I'm inviting you to join the work. He went to each of the 12 disciples and invited them to follow him. He obviously had a lot more if he was appointing 72. And he says, I do, you watch, we talk. And I went through the Gospels, I went through Mark specifically, and I looked at every question that Jesus asked. And he gives some very interesting things. He, he says to the disciples, when there's 5,000 people that are, that are uh, hungry, he says, so what are we going to feed them? And they're starting to calculate how many days wages. And, and, but he starts asking them questions. Listen carefully. He never asked questions because he didn't know the answers. He asked questions because he's trying to create thinking. Or I would say stronger, he asked questions because he's trying to create disciples. And so he asks them these questions. And then we do, and we talk together, and then you do. This is the scary part. I'm sending you out. I watch. We talk. And hopefully the process continues to where you invite somebody, and then you do, and they watch. And you continue that process of handing off a skill, of handing off a lifestyle, of turning learners into disciples. Uh, I think all of us have some skill at this, if you're a parent or a grandparent. And by the way, all you grandparents, happy Grandparents Day. Did you know that's what it was? Yeah, all right. How many of you grandparents? All right. How many of you are committed to discipling your grandchildren? Ah, it's an important part of being a grandparent, isn't it? One little girl said, Grandma's like a mom, only she has time. <laughs> great, great role for us. So I, I once did a pre-marriage counseling for a young couple, and they were about 19, 20, and I'd met with them several times, and I've known them for several years, and after one of the sessions, in an aside, the bride-to-be said to me, do you think it's going to be a problem if his mom still makes his bed? <laughs> so what's your answer to that? <laughs> My answer was, it's not a problem if you don't mind taking over exactly where his mom left off, because that's exactly what he's going to expect, right? So, so here's the point. It takes more time to teach your kid to make their bed than it does just to make it for them. But is it a worthwhile investment? Yeah, does it take a process to get them to learn how to do it? It's the same with any skill, and I would say it's the same with discipleship, that God brings us along and he challenges us, and then he asks us questions by his spirit, and he gives us challenges in the church family. He gives us opportunities to serve. And here's my question. Over on the right side of your sheet where it's blank, I want you to write this question. What holds me back? God never intended us to be ornamental. He intended us to be useful. And since most of us are not very ornamental, we better lean into the other side of it. I think why people don't do it is because, number one, we're afraid. I think we're afraid of failing. I think we're afraid of what people will think. If I try this and don't look good at it, and you know, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly till you can do it better. You will never become a senior, an excellent, an expert in the first round. So you have to start as a freshman. You have to start as a beginner. And you have to start as a learner. But if it's worth doing, 
it's worth practicing. And let me tell you, other believers around you are great help in this practice. The sharpening each other is as you watch them, as they challenge you, as they ask you questions, as you ask them questions. God intended this process of development to be a community thing, to be us challenging and encouraging and interacting with each other. And so, what holds you back? Is it fear of people? We're so afraid of what people will think. Have you ever noticed you walk into a poll or do something dumb and the first thing you do is look around and see what? If anybody noticed, right? My mom said, you would worry less about what people think of you if you realized how seldomly they do. (laughs) Why? Because they're worried about what you think about them. And I want to tell you, fear is a terrible master. It takes everything away and it gives you nothing. And if you are disobeying God out of fear of what might happen, then you're obeying the wrong master. And so Jesus sends him out. And I I think sometimes people are just... (laughs) responsibility averse. They are commitment phobes. And you get to the place where you've been in a life group and you're trained and you know how to do it and you've even gone to life group training. And then one of the leaders says, would you take a life group and lead it? Whoa! And sometimes the answer is simply, I don't want that responsibility. Is it a responsibility to step in and disciple others to lead? Yeah, it is. It's a big responsibility. But you know what? It's also how you make the biggest difference. We are tending to be spectators instead of participants. We are tending to say what's going to be on the test instead of saying what's God's assignment for me. We tend to listen instead of respond. So what happened with Jesus' experiment? Well, he did a good thing a good leader does. He held a debrief afterwards. And he says to him, it says, the 72 returned with joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What's the leadership principle there? When you get people involved in doing something, you need to debrief them. And when they, you debrief them, you give them encouragement. I saw Satan fall from heaven. You're going to step on scorpions, and I, I think he's meaning spiritual forces and evil. And you're going to triumph. And he says, you're going to change the world. That's the encouragement part. And then he says, however, don't get a big head about what I'm doing through you. Stay grateful. Stay humble. Remember that you've been given this great gift. Here's the leadership principle. When you debrief somebody, tell them what they did right and then give one one possible correction. What happens to us, especially with our kids? We get them out to do something and then we tell them 47 things they did wrong. Why? Because they weren't perfect. Well, they're not going to be. And if you discourage them at the beginning, they'll never get there. So, What does that mean? I I want to give you this very important leadership tool. I believe that Jesus was a master at asking great questions. Questions that would challenge people. Read through the Gospels. Sometimes the questions were like, he looks back at the disciples and he says, what were you guys talking about on the way here? (laughs) And they're going, um, because they were talking about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. Some of his questions were about authenticity. I believe that this is a lesson for every single one of us because I believe very few people know how to ask great questions. Some people don't even pause in their monologues to ask any questions because when you ask questions, you have to stop and listen. I want to challenge you to learn how to ask great questions. So we were in a marriage coaching uh, training And uh, Brent and Felicia were the young couple that were involved in helping demonstrate. And Alan, who was teaching the lesson, was talking about asking great questions. So they're sitting there talking, and they bring up the problem. And Felicia says, I hate it that we can't ever be on time. We are always late, no matter what I try to do. And, And Brent just seems to have a real not wanting to get in the program. 
And so they dialogued for a while, following all the I statements and active listening, and they, they weren't really getting anywhere. And finally, Alan said, Brent, I, I have a question for you. He said, why do you have such a high value on being late? <laughs> I wish I had a picture of his face at the time. It's like, I don't... I don't have a high value for being late. And Alan said, well, that's amazing because according to your wife, you have achieved it with almost 100% accuracy. <laughs> and you know what? All of a sudden, it turned it from an argument to an opportunity to learn. And they began talking about what is it that goes through my head when, I, when, I am <laughs> when my wife is saying, let's start getting ready. But you see, it was the question that brought the learning. Wouldn't you love to know how to ask those kind of questions? Not something that's offensive or angry, but just something that, that is a way to open up people to learning. Let me show you in a story that you may be familiar with how Jesus uses questions. Luke chapter 10. It says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, let me give you a couple of clues here. He's an expert in the law. His head is full of the Bible, right? In the Jewish culture, it was not only the spiritual work, it was their civil work, it was their laws, it was their court. And he stands up him in order to what? Yeah, this is not necessarily a sincere heart about how can I become a follower. This is like, I'm going to see if you're as good as you say. And Jesus, teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? There's one of the perfect questions for you to ask. You know, I think too often we try to tell people what the Bible says, especially people that are a little argumentative. And, and somebody taught me a great technique one time. They said, well, let's look at, here's John 3.16. Why don't you read that for me, would you? And they read it to you and you say, what do you think that says? How much more powerful is that than you just saying, here's what I'm going to tell you and I'm right and you're wrong. So he says to him, how do you read it? And what does the expert in the law say? He goes on and he says, verse 27, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. See, this guy was caught in his own head. He had a head full of information but he didn't have any application in his life. He didn't care about his neighbor at all. And it goes on, and it says, desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? I think what he's saying is, give me a minimum requirement of the fewest people possible that I actually have to be nice to. I really like to be right about everything, and I'll try to be kind to a few people, but let's not make this, like, extreme, right? And... He's coming at Jesus with what I'm afraid happens to too many Christians is that they are educated way beyond their obedience. We have all the answers, the questions, but we have not a lifestyle that follows. And I'll tell you, God can do more with the people that know a little bit and live it out than with people that know a whole bunch and just ask tricky questions to try to justify themselves. So, what did Jesus say? He told a story that may be one of his most famous stories. He said, on the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho, which, by the way, is a treacherous piece of road, it's 3,300 feet down through a desert. It was a, they called it at times the Bloody Pass. It's 14 miles of desolate hiding places. And so, the guy's going down, and he's mugged. They beat him up, and they take his money and he's left bleeding on the side of the road. That's the scenario Jesus sets up. And then he says there's three people that walk down that road. And one is a priest. And in their thinking, he's the top of the pile. He was holy to the Lord. He was doing the sacrifices. He was involved in their worship. They would have seen him as very worthy. And he looks over and he sees that bloody guy that may be soon dead and it says he goes to the opposite side and walks on down the path. Well, you see, he was following the rules. If you touch a guy that's all bloody and he ends up dead, you might be unclean. Then you couldn't do your sacrifices. 
then you couldn't be a priest. So he lived in self-protection instead of caring for this man. And then it says a Levite walked down the road. I had never thought of this before, but the guy asking Jesus the question, it says he was an expert in the law. I'll bet he was a Levite. I'll bet Jesus roped him into this story right here and said, so then there was a Levite walking down the road, and he did exactly the same thing. And then he he picked somebody that they would have thought was a heretic and disgusting and below their social status, a Samaritan. And he said, and he walks by him and says he's moved with compassion. He he goes over and he bandages his wounds and he puts him on his donkey and he takes him to a, a place where he can be cared for and he gives him his own money and he takes care of him. And that's the story that has spawned a hundred hospitals. <laughs> we know the story of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan's Purse. And then I want you to see that Jesus didn't just tell a story. He asked a question. He said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among the thieves? You see, the man was asking, who are my neighbors that I have to love? And Jesus flipped the question on his head and he said, let's make that a verb. Who neighbored this man? And he says, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, what? Go and do likewise. Quit walking on the other side of the path and start looking at the wreckage of the people's lives around you. Get off your high horse and get out into the field. Get doing something if you want to be a follower of mine. But do you see how adroitly he answers those questions? He, he asks those questions. You mean, which one was a neighbor to this man? I believe this is such an important thing to learn how to answer questions and to ask good questions because, listen carefully, truth that is unapplied becomes a hindrance to further truth. It log jams you up. And you know what it does? It puts that thing in your mind that says, oh, I already know this. Oh, we're going to do the parable of the Good Samaritan? Oh, I know that. And as soon as that, I know that, comes into your head, you quit learning. Instead of what new is here that God wants to show me, or, wow, I never thought of that before. And let me show you how this really needs to work. This is part of why we do this in life groups. And this is so important. It's easy in a Bible study to look at the Good Samaritan and say, what did you learn out of that? And somebody says, wow, I didn't know it was 14 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem. It was 3,300 feet. It was a desolate pathway. Wow, that's really interesting factoids that I didn't know before. Does that change your life? No, it doesn't. That's not the point of the, of the story. So we ask in the life groups questions like, so which one of those are you more like right now? Whoa. That pulls it out of the head and towards the heart, doesn't it? It's like, well, I feel like I'm the guy that's beaten up and bloody by the road. I've been, <laughs> I've been ambushed and that's, that's me. That's, <laughs> let me tell you about my life right now. Is that a fine answer? That's a great open share. Be authentic. Maybe some of you say, I feel like God's been whispering to me and I've been doing those assignments and, and right now I'm, I'm operating like that Samaritan. I, I feel like this is a challenge to me. But I'm afraid most of us would have to say, I'm like the priest and the Levite. There's people all around me whose lives are in wreck and I carefully don't get involved because to do so would mean I might fail. It means I'm going to have to sacrifice. It's going to cost me. It's going to be difficult because you know helping people is a messy business. And if we're going to be people who help people find and follow Jesus, we're going to have to embrace the messiness of it. We wish we could give somebody three Bible verses and tell them to call us next week and everything would be fine. And that doesn't happen, does it? So if we ask you that question, where are you in that story? You feel like that you're somebody that when God moves your heart to see somebody in need, you automatically step in. And I don't mean giving the money to the guy that's standing beside the road with a sign that says, hungry and homeless. What I mean is that it begins to be a lifestyle, not just of meeting people's physical needs, but looking at people who need to be developed and discipled and encouraged and stepping in 
and learning how to ask great questions. We talk about the spiritual pathway fairly often. And, and I don't know if this guy in the story, the expert in the law, was a stuck seeker who didn't really want to follow God. He just wanted a head full of knowledge so he could be right. Have you ever noticed that being right is sometimes a hindrance to being learning and growing and vibrant? Or he could have been a stuck student. I think the church is full of stuck students. And you know how I know? It's because they still want it to be all about them. I want a class for what I'm interested in, and I want the stories that I like, and I want the songs that I want to sing, and I want the temperature set to my degrees. I want a good parking spot. I love coming to church when it's all about me. That's a student. As a student, you've got to learn to ask questions like, where do I start reading in the Bible? What's an Old Testament? What is Jesus talking about here? Those are important questions, aren't they? As a servant, as you bleed over and start working towards where God begins to say, I have poured into you, now it's time for you to get off the bench and out into the field and pour into somebody else. And you begin to serve, not just because somebody caught you because you were too slow going through the lobby and they have a, we need a greeter or we need a kids worker or... No, it's because you begin to have that conviction that God has blessed you and you need to get in the game somehow. And I love it when people who are serving and they're greeting at the door or they're helping with kids ministry or they're taking on a life group, not because somebody asked them, but because that was an assignment from God. They're called to family church. They're called to that ministry. because, And God sometimes uses people to <laughs> extend that call but they feel like this is between them and God. And then the wonderful part is you become a steward is you go back and you start helping answer good questions, but you also start asking great questions. You start learning how to prompt somebody and get them moving. And speaking of which, let me answer a question that may come up as you look at the scripture. Is the way to get eternal life to go help people who are bloody beside the road? Now, Jesus didn't share the gospel with him. Jesus had not yet died on the cross. He, he had not yet been risen. The way to come from being a seeker to being a student is that you acknowledge that I can't do it no matter how hard I try. You know, I think what, the, what Jesus really wanted from that expert in the law is for him to recognize the harden of his heart and that he couldn't do what God demanded. And so by submitting and believing that Jesus really is the only answer and that I am desperately in need without him and giving my life to him, I cross the line and then you have eternal life. And then we can live in that place of appropriate response to God. So, God talks about the scripture being a sword. Each of us are swords and either you are being sharpened or you're sharpening others. And you need to ask yourself, am I a sword that just sits on the wall being ornamental? Has God poured all of these resources into me so that I could look good? Or am I being sharpened and prepared? And part of sharpening is learning how to use God's word. And part of sharpening is learning how to pray and learning how to step into people's lives and how to ask great questions. How to defend the territory, how to extend the kingdom, how to be what God has called us to be. And I don't know what that means exactly for you, but I love it when God takes his word and God speaks through his word and through me and then it comes to you and you hear exactly what the Spirit's telling you to step up and do. I'm going to hand off to South Umqua and to Green and I want... Sky and Will, you guys, to walk through a couple of key challenges and questions. Love you guys. Here's the question. What is God trying to teach you? God did a wonderful work when a high school group that I was a part of in a little town called Green Acres over at the coast. And God began to do a great thing. We had a church of 120 and there were 25 kids that met on Tuesday night and we were seeking God. And you know what the course of our meeting was? It was extremely simple. We spent a half hour singing. A bunch of us played guitars. 
And then we went around the circle and everybody answered the question, what do you think God is trying to teach you? What a powerful question. Number one, it's like, I've got to admit, God's trying to teach me something. And they shared the stories of their life and what was going on. And it wasn't just whining time. Sometimes prayer time is just whining time. It was, I know this is going on in my life, but I think this is what God is trying to teach me. You wanted one surefire question you can ask almost every believer once you get into a dialogue and you get past the hunting and fishing and uh, sports and cars or whatever? Ask him, what do you think God is trying to teach you right now? And you know what? They may give you an answer that they're not happy with. And it may bore into their heart and bother them for a year, which is the perfect kind of question. What is God trying to teach you? And I would challenge you today, what is God trying to teach you right now? What assignments is God giving you? What things is he challenging you to? What is he wanting you to step out of fear and out of self-absorption and get involved in serving and loving and caring for people and learning to ask great questions? I tell you, sometimes pastors are the worst life group leaders there are. You know why? Because everybody wants to read the passage and say, Paul, what does it mean? And you know what my temptation is? I'll tell you what it means. And I am learning to say, I don't know, how do you read it? And what do you think? And what do you think? And I only step up if gross heretical error begins to creep in. But people learn far more when they discover it for themselves than they do when somebody just hands it to them. And I'm learning to ask better questions and give fewer answers. And I would challenge you to do the same. In fact, let me give you a specific. Here's your assignment this week. Ask three great questions. Pastor Will said he had a friend who, every time he came home from school, is from grade school, his parents would say to him, not what did you learn today, not what assignments did you have. They would ask him, did you ask any great questions today? Isn't that different? But I am convinced that asking great questions is more challenging to me and it's more challenging to other people than it is just to paste on an answer. So try to ask somebody a great question three times this week to get them thinking, to get them growing, to get them challenged, whether it's your kids or your grandkids or somebody that you're pouring into. I believe that that's what Jesus is modeling for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the people in my life that have come along and have asked me penetrating, convicting, sometimes embarrassing questions that are far less about what do I know and are far more about how do I understand this and how do I grow and how do I learn. And Father, I believe that there are some who are here that have been sitting on the bench and I know, God, that not all of our serving comes within the church family and, and taking a class or taking a spot. And I, I ask, God, that you'd help us to hear your assignments of how to lead our sports team in a way that honors you, of how to pour into our kids or grandkids in a way that honors you, how to ask a coworker or a fellow student a question that gets them thinking. And I pray, Father, that as we hear those assignments this week, that we would step away from our fear and that we'd step into it with excitement of the adventure that you've called us to. Help us, God, to pour out our lives as we sharpen each other, as we challenge each other, as we grow to follow you more closely. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.